Support for Lab Out Loud is provided by the National Science Teachers Association. Find out more at nsta.org. You're listening to Lab Out Loud, science for the classroom and beyond. Coming up in today's episode, we're talking about citizen science and its possibilities for the classroom. Yes, citizen science is excellent in classrooms. Sometimes the way students learn science or the opportunities they have maybe don't make it as exciting as it really is because they might be doing even scientific experiments, but they're ones that have already been done before. They're recreating. But then if you take it another step and it's like, oh, well, here's a way can be participating in actual, you know, authentic scientific research where we don't actually know the answer yet and be part of that discovery, you know, that can be a huge motivation for more learning. That's up next on Lab Out Loud. But first, I'm your co-host, Dale Basler. And I'm Brian Bartell. And we're back again for a brand new year, 2017. Yeah, it's a new year and new ideas and new new challenges. New, New year, new me, which is all over like social media. New year, new me. Uh, well, you know, the funny thing is, is I'm starting to see NYE, like New Year's Eve. I was seeing that all over stores. Mm-hmm. And all I could think about was, wow, Bill Nye is really popular in the mall. <laughs> hey, Bill Nye has a show, new show coming up on Netflix. That's going to be about science, uh, science in the news, basically. So it's a science talk show. So if you're see. listening, Bill, we, we'd love to have you back. Have you back. No kidding. Um, but, you know, other things I saw on social media, I'm flipping through uh, my Twitter feed, and all of a sudden there's this picture of a bug. And it's like, does anybody know what this is? It bought, it, it, it bit me or something like that. I'm like, oh, this is interesting. And it was, it was retweeted, and it was tagged with uh, the term citizen science. And I was like, oh, what's this? And I kind of dug a little bit farther, and that's how I found today's guest. I'm Karen Cooper, and I'm an associate professor at North Carolina State University in a program called the Chancellor's Faculty Excellence in Leadership in Public Science. And I'm jointly appointed at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences as assistant head of the Biodiversity Research Lab. And that's a lot of titles. Yeah. Um, that's quite a business card. I, <laughs> I, I study birds primarily. Um, oh. And I, I rely heavily on um, citizen science for my research with birds. So I partner with bird watchers mostly. Um, and then I also have a big interest just in understanding citizen science and how to design it well and make it really effective both for advancing science and then also for so that people get a lot out of it. There is a huge group of bird watchers. Is it still growing? It is, yeah. I mean, some surveys say like one in five people or, you know, at least uh, watch birds like in some way or have interest in birds and put up bird feeders. Or I always like them. to tell my kids, there goes a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. It is a dinosaur. And my wife is a kindergarten teacher. I had dinosaur eggs for breakfast. That's right. Yeah. I my my wife will tell me like, oh, as a kindergarten teacher, stop telling them that. They're they're gonna they're gonna get their teachers mad at them. I'm like, wow. <laughs> no way. That's, I go with truth. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, the bird bird studying. What makes it uh, citizen science? The you know you know what what where's the jump or where's the decision between you know I'm just watching birds compared to citizen science? Yeah, that's a good question. So the jump from watching birds to having it be citizen science is when Mm -hmm. someone not only, um, well, not only makes note about what they see, but they share it to, you know, in some kind of database or in some kind of format or, you know, in some way that it's shared uh, as part of a larger effort um, with a scientist. So a lot of bird watchers probably start off just sort of recreational. Hey, there's a finch. And then mm-hmm. some of them make the leap to sharing it and re- recording and sharing them. What's the gateway right. bird in this situation? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to guess a cardinal. But, um, yeah, so, yeah, a lot of people, uh, for whatever reason, really like to make lists. <laughs> like That's a common trait among bird watchers. They like to list things. They like to record what they see. They like to often keep, you know, life lists, keep journals of what they see. And so that's, like, perfect skills for huh the data collection in science. And then, um, so a lot of times, really what happens is the, there'll be a hobby like that where people are doing something that's so so similar to scientific research, but it just needs a little tweak just to make it more rigorous. Like, so for example, with bird watching, I mean, it's great to know what people see, but it's also really great to know what they don't see. So that's even more valuable. So then, you know, we just teach people to record, you know, to, <laughs> to do a complete checklist, right, and tell us what you saw, and, and let us know that you didn't leave anything out, right, as opposed to just reporting the, what you thought was a cool bird. So what are some things that 
we should be looking for that we're not seeing? <laughs> well, what I mean is, uh, well, sometimes people call it zero data or negative data. It's just sometimes a hard thing for people to oh, yeah, realize yeah. that it's important, right, to know presence and absence. Uh, it just helps oh. better with, like, mapping species distributions and stuff if you know um, both the presence and absence at any given location. So people often forget that even when they didn't see something, that that's important. I used to do uh, an, an activity in one of my classes, uh, and it was all about observation. And, and, and one of the key points that we tried to kind of hone in on, again, was uh, what are you not seeing and what is not there? And uh, students really kind of struggled with that at first because they're like, well, it's, a, you know, we were describing a lot of times like the difference between a Bunsen burner flame with the closed ports and open ports. And it was just, again, an observational kind of technique there. Um, and they, they really struggled at first, but then they kind of got onto it. Like, yeah, it's important that you don't hear sound versus hearing sound and other things like that. Sure. Now, how is it shared then? Back to the, the birds. Have you got your yeah. list? Who's here? Who's not? Um, <laughs> well, I mean, so it really varies from project to project. Um, I mean, like an iconic project in citizen science is eBird. And, oh, and so yeah. Then people We've can talked share, about that. Yeah. yeah, we talked about so they that. They can share their checklists. Um, there's apps or they can go on the website. You know, so there's basically big data repositories now in a lot of different citizens, you know, for a lot of different types of citizen science data. Um, I work with bird watchers who like sort of a subset, uh-huh. sort of a niche group of bird watchers who really love bluebirds, and they mon- they put up bluebird um, nest boxes like birdhouses, and they monitor those and and so they share different data um, about their nest monitoring about who you know which birds nest and what happens to those nests. Um, Are they gentle with people that come in and like want to talk about uh, oh. blue j- blue jays versus bluebirds and? <laughs> Are you like bird snobs? Is that what you're... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, well, actually, uh, we don't really let the bird blue jays in here, guys. Yeah, they're... they're well, you know, you get you get that sometimes. <laughs> it's bird citizen, watchers it's, are a funny group. Citizen science I, means all citizens. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, <laughs> I've done some studies of bird watchers, but I don't know if I... <laughs> do you see um this getting involved do you see classrooms getting involved with this because what you were describing you know like noting the birds in your environment i could almost see a, a even a really young class having that as part of their daily routine go out oh yeah you know yeah. E- even out the window if it's... oh yeah for sure out the, yeah so yeah citizen science is excellent in classrooms um sometimes the way students learn science or the opportunities they have maybe don't make it as exciting as it really is, you know, either because they're memorizing certain things mm-hmm. or because they might be um, doing even scientific experiments, but they won, they're they ones that have already been done before. So the outcome oh, is sure. already known. They're recreating you know, so just, things. Yep. Yeah, they're, just, they're recreating, which is great. I mean, you learn, you can learn by, you know, by well, there's definitely merit in things. that, but yeah. it's, not, yeah. it's not true science but then, in that sense. Right. But then if you take it another step and it's like, oh, well, here's a way can be participating in actual, you know, authentic scientific research where we don't actually know the answer yet and be part of that discovery mm-hmm. and, and really, like, spark that curiosity and that desire to want to know the answer. You know, that can be a huge um, motivation for, for more learning. And so, yeah, there's a lot of citizen science in classrooms already, a lot of teachers taking advantage of that. There's, um, well, with birds, there's uh, what well, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology they have great uh, classroom resources called Bird Sleuth. And then here at my institution at NC State, there's resources called Students Discover, and it's, the website is studentsdiscover.org. And, and those are lesson plans on all kinds of topics uh, with citizen science, and, and those were created by teachers. Mm. Um, there's, a, there's a program here where teachers come in in the summer, and they work with citizen science projects and with scientists, and they develop lesson plans for their classrooms, and then they test them out and whatnot and refine them, and then they um, share them on the website. And so there's um, a growing number there as well, um, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, and then we there's have... another resource. Oh, I'll just tell you, there's one other mm-hmm. resource, which is um, called SciStarter, and uh, SciStarter.com. Oh, yes. And, and that's, the huge, that's the largest repository of citizen science projects in the world. And there's, you know, there's, I think right now, maybe 1,500 projects on there. Um, and oh, wow. every project 
people can review it, you know, just like on Amazon, you know, you can give it <laughs> however many stars or whatever. Mm-hmm. And w- there's a general review, but then there's also a, a place for teachers to give reviews for how, um, how suitable the project is for the classroom. Oh, okay. And, uh, yeah, and we've actually had a head start on that. There was a bunch of teachers in, uh, I think, in Broward County in Florida who um, went ahead and, um, and did a big effort to uh, uh, um, look at a bunch of different projects and, and rate, rate them. For other so your, your projects, so you, if you have a project idea, you put it in SciStarter and then it'll get essentially peer reviewed? Well, if you have a citizen science project that's mm-hmm. like functional and going and you oh, know, legit okay. and everything, and it's in SciStarter, then yeah, it can be, teachers and others can review it. Um, and, you know, yeah, okay. basically. And then I feedback. suppose you could go there and look at, if you're looking to get a citizen science project, you could look at ones that you could add to or emulate, right? Right. Well, I mean, you can find, uh, yeah, you can, there's different search criteria you can use to find, like, the project that is most suited for your interests, or if you're a teacher, most suited for your classroom needs. Um, yeah, all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. So we, we're in Wisconsin, yeah, we're in Wisconsin here, and, and of course, Elder Leopold is part of our collective cultural history. And so I, I know that there are places around here, and, and again, we have a, a pretty decent environmental education component here in Wisconsin, but I know that there's a lot of schools that have phenological projects uh, tracking, the, you know, the, uh, like when something first appears on a calendar month and things like that and during the year. Do you see any of those? Yeah, the phenology projects. Um, are super important. Uh, yeah, like Journey North and Nature's Notebook, um, Bud Burst. Yeah, there's a lot of projects that keep track of that, which has become obviously super important in in terms of understanding climate change mm-hmm. um, and how how you know different environments. Shh, we can't are say that. Responding to climate change. <laughs> oh wait, we can say that until the 17th. We're okay. Oh now. yeah, that, Brian's referring <laughs> to our state getting rid of the words the words oh, from our. Uh, did you hear that? Was that Department of Natural Resources? Yeah. yeah. Did, you, did you hear about that? So that our DNR scrubbed mm-hmm. references to climate change in Wisconsin. But uh, right. yeah, yeah, I heard that. Our state has done similar things in the past. In oh, that's right. Of, uh, yeah. You have a yeah, lot of governmental so, uh, yeah. c- comparisons. Fun. Yes. <laughs> what state yeah, are you in? Too. North Carolina. Oh, yeah. North Carolina. You listen in the yeah. beginning. Um, <laughs> yeah. Fun and, times. <laughs> yeah, well, and, that, and you know what's exciting about citizen science in the classroom too is that, well, I mean, with science education, um, you know, there's really, I guess we could think of it as there's some kids who are going to be so excited about it they're going to go on career tracks to being scientists, and sometimes they're the ones we tend to focus on. But really, what's great with citizen science is it offers this whole opportunity for people who have don't want to have that be their career track. Yeah. But it still can be a part of their life, right? And it's a, it's like a form of civic engagement. It's a form of fun, right? Just like people do sports, right? Or people get, you know, civically engaged in other ways, you know, in politics or something. Um, sure. People can get involved in science throughout their life. And so I think that's a really great a great thing. Now, you, you really took citizen science to the next level because you've just recently released a book about it. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, my new book is called Citizen Science. How Ordinary People Are Changing the Face of Discovery. Uh, It just came out in late December. And yeah, I'm super excited about it. Really, I guess what I was hoping to accomplish with the book was to share a lot of stories about citizen science in all different fields um, and the many different ways it looks. A lot of times people become familiar with like one type of citizen science, like they might see Galaxy Zoo, you know, or something online and think, oh, that's citizen science and not realize that it's also a whole bunch of other things, like, or some people might be familiar with, like, community-based efforts of monitoring air pollution or, or mm-hmm. like, the Flint water crisis and, and think, oh, sure. oh, that's citizen science and think it's only oh, that one thing. Yeah. And, and the thing is, what's so amazing is all these different things. There's so many different ways that people can be involved in science and so many different reasons to do so and benefits that arise from it. And so that's kind of... Um, in the end, hoping it. it would really, uh, yeah, it'd be a, a like a, a rallying call to do it. People get excited about it, and also just think differently about knowledge production because ultimately that's what it is. Like mm-hmm. we're in this information mm-hmm. age, and everyone's used to like, oh, I'll just find. I'm curious about something. I'll just go and look on Wikipedia, or I'll do a Google search. Yeah. But really, yeah. there's so much that we don't know, <laughs> and and that and how we make new knowledge. People think oftentimes think, oh, well, it just needs to come from scientists. But really, we can start to think different about that, about who makes knowledge, about 
where that happens and about, you know, who can be involved in it and, and who it really serves. Um, and so I think when people start to think about knowledge production and being engaged in that, they we can also start to see how we could address some of our big societal problems in a different way. It's engaging people and it's, it sounds like you're, it's democratizing this basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it is. One of the Um, concerns that I might think about immediately is, is as we're getting into this right now with uh, citizens, let me just backstep a second here. Um, I'm thinking in terms of like fake news and how do we, that's where I thought you were going to go. Yeah. How do we pour through the volumes of knowledge that are being created out there for credibility when we democratize science to the, you know, the general user level. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. Cause it's, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how to tackle that one. I mean, a lot of times what people, maybe it's sort of the same question. They often frame it in terms of data quality. Like how could oh, people sure. without formal training, you know, possibly be of value to scientific research, but Um, you know, which is what I tried to illustrate in my book because there's so many different ways it's of value. Like, I mean, like one of the biggest um, mysteries that that we had, like, is like, I guess, from the 1950s on or whatever, people were looking at is like, where do monarch butterflies go um, in the winter? Where do they go, right? All these, up in your neck of the woods, right? In Mm -hmm. Wisconsin and in southern Canada. And it was citizen science, really, that made that discovery. It was teachers a lot of teachers and their students capturing and tagging monarch butterflies um, that eventually led to those tagged butterflies being seen in Mexico and realizing mm-hmm. like, wow, those, those white little butterflies migrate that far. And um, how do you tag you know, so butterflies? Those, how do you tag them? Bam, li- little, really, <laughs> yeah. Really <laughs> yeah, tiny little people, tags. Yeah. Like little stamps. Okay. Um, maybe even smaller than a stamp. They have tiny and little passports, it was because Brian. There was, it was when uh, lickable stamps, I think, or like easy adhesive stamps were invented that oh. soon after that, that, that people figured out, oh, you know what? We could tag butterflies. Um, that was the 50s, Dale. But, they didn't need a passport to get to Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. But, you know, the thing is the type of expertise needed, you know, is like sort of a natural history expertise and, you know, um, stuff that people – enjoy as a hobby. Mm-hmm. And anyway, so that kind kind of thing is super valuable uh, with citizen science. You, you started um, off talking about birds because birds is your background. And, and that's the one I can see, you know, as having a long history of citizen science, um, you know, even recording different animals and things like that. Um, you said in your book, you try to showcase all different areas. What's, what's a citizen science area that we would have never thought of as a... <laughs> you know, content area that would allow citizens to participate in? Well, a lot of, one area that people often don't realize is with distributed computing networks. And Mm -hmm. some people don't call that citizen science, but I do. Um, And so there's a lot of problems that are so computationally intensive that a single computer can't solve them. Like Folded? Um, Oh, Yeah, yeah, like, so Folded is a, it was stemmed from that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so Rosetta at home or folding at home, a lot of these projects that have the at home on them are in yeah. distributed computing networks. And so, yeah, there's a lot of biochemistry problems that are super computationally intensive. And so, yeah, people who, and this is another hobby group that some people don't know about, they're called overclockers. Mm-hmm. And their mm-hmm. hobby is to really soup up their computers with really high powered GPUs and whatnot and I mean, they might use liquid nitrogen to cool these computers. Like, I mean, they just want them to be, like, performing, like, at amazing capacities. And then they want to compete. And it's so like they sign up for computer drag racing. It, it's exactly computer mm-hmm. drag racing. Now, Dale and I <laughs> love technology, and sometimes we have to justify our purchases to our wives. <laughs> I see this as now we can say, <laughs> this liquid nitrogen this is for science. science. <laughs> well, uh, isn't all liquid nitrogen for science? <laughs> yeah, well, people do invest a lot of money in it, and you know, and 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 they are glad to do it because they are also know that they are sort of donating to science their computer time and energy. Um, you that's know, but perfect. a lot. I, I mean, they know it's that's not the one research. I would have thought of. Um, you know, like the, those kinds of because people are installing it at home and it's a hobby, but that's definitely citizen science because it's contributing back to a large project. And I just would have never made that connection. <laughs> And some of the people have, like, sort of virtual shrines on their 
computing um, website, you know, in memory of people they've lost to the diseases oh. that are being studied, oh, yeah. you know, through those distributed computing networks. But it was one of those, Rosetta at Home, that the, the screensaver, when, when the computers would go idle and start, send, you know, helping in the distributed network, the screensaver was showing the computer sort of working out this protein folding problem. And people were looking at it and saying, hmm, I feel like I could do that better. <laughs> and when they told the scientists that, the scientists said, oh, okay, well, let's give you a try. And, and they collaborated with game developers and they made Fold It. Yeah. And, and sure enough, people were right. People are better than computer algorithms at solving these three-dimensional um, puzzles. And At it's because right people now. have imagination and creativity, and, and they work together, too. There's mm-hmm. a lot to be said for sort of um, crowd intelligence or group intelligence, um, where it people actually diversity. figure things out better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people come at problems from different ways and, and work together. So, so, yeah, there's a lot of online citizen science that way. Um, there's also, of course, online citizen science that are really sort of micro-tasks, um, like the Zooniverse is a really great hub for online citizen science, um, and people might tag photographs or transcribe texts or um, annotate sound recordings. Like th- there's just a whole variety of things that um, that people can do. It doesn't take a lot of time, mm-hmm. but like when you get like literally hundreds of thousands of people all doing a little bit, a lot of work gets done. Now, there's one thing, Karen, that it gets me a little bit upset about citizen science, and it has nothing, I mean, it may not be out of your wheel well there, but um, access to science is, is something that I think the public is sorely missing out on unless they actually go through some kind of like a library or institution where science journals are purchased and they can actually like look up articles. And, and as a citizen who pays for some of that, you know, I, I'm sure you've heard this, uh, you know, reasoning before. It's been out there. You know, we should have more access to the science that is being done, especially on ta- taxpayer dimes. Um, where can yeah. the average citizen go to learn more uh, quality science that way? Yeah, it's a good question. So there, I mean, there is a movement, you know, called open science, uh-huh. sort of movement mm-hmm. to make um, all parts of science more transparent and open. Um, you know, both to peers, science peers around the world and to the public. And um, so, you know, so for example, with peer-reviewed journals, there's a, a movement to have open access journals mm-hmm. where, where there's not a subscription fee to read them. <clears throat> but I feel like that only gets us just so far because it actually takes a lot of sort of experience and training and familiarity to be able to understand a, a science. Sure. There's certainly, with citizen science projects, sort of the best practices that are emerging in this, you know, very rapidly changing field, you know, is that, uh, is that researchers have an obligation to, to make the results of the work, as well as even, you know, the data, to make it accessible and, and as useful as possible to the people yes, who are contributing to the project. So, like, eBird is a really great example with mm-hmm. this. I mean, the data that all these bird watchers are contributing are being used by scientists for a lot of different research purposes, being used to inform uh, management decisions on the ground, um, you know, and policy kind of things. And then also it's put in a form that is easy and accessible for bird watchers to use for what they want to do, which is figure out where they want to go to see certain birds, <laughs> you know, where hot spots are or, or whatever. So um, I think there's probably whole vacations planned around this, isn't there? Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No, and that, and that that's important because we we've noted of course that, you know, just getting that information out there. I mean, we when Dale and I try to reach out to people to talk to, a lot of times researchers are are very keen to talk to us because they know that that's part of their mission is to spread the word of what they're doing to the public. And so um, we we love to see that and hear from that as well. But um, sometimes, and, and this gets into maybe a different topic about science literacy and communication of science to the public. Hmm. But I, I obviously feel like there's there's an opportunity to to kind of merge those two, like you said, with eBird and other resources. Yeah, well, so my job here at NC State is in this, um, what's called a faculty cluster called Leadership in Public Science. And really what we're going to be doing is um, is sort of training the next generation of scientists, you know, the graduate students that come to work with us, Mm -hmm. and 
teaching them to be what we're calling public scientists, which means they're familiar with techniques like citizen science, open science, and yeah. science communication, and that they really learn to do science in a very public-facing way. Like my lab at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, one entire wall of it is entirely glass. <laughs> so we're basically kind of on exhibit. <laughs> so uh, every visitor that here comes they are in their museum, natural habitat. <laughs> right, Literal <yeah>. transparency. <laughs> <laughs> don't bang on it. <laughs> Let's poke one with a stick and see. <laughs> they don't like it and when you bang peanuts. on the glass. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, yeah, but it's great. So people can see... Um, see all of us scientists at different stages, our undergraduates, our graduate students, the postdocs, the faculty, all of us, you know, um, doing different, different types of work. Um, it's obviously more exciting when we're not just at our computers and <laughs> when we have mm -hmm. um, some of our, the more interesting stuff we'll do right at the glass, um, like if we're curating specimens into the collection and whatnot. Uh, huh. But anyway. That's yeah. neat. It's, well, it's and the whole idea of, of just getting science more visible. Well, and it's interesting. Not having I, it be in a black box. I just listened to uh, an, an interview with um, Hope Jaron, who wrote Lab Girl, and yeah. she talked about this mystique of science that you know. And on one end, uh, there's science that needs to be kind of private and transparent to keep up its uh, mystery a little bit, but also they struggle with the public communication as well. And so there's this balancing act, as also. Yeah, I guess there's also science that's done in industry that stays secret for trade secrets kind of thing reasons too yeah i mean in some ways that's a whole parallel track because mm -hmm. yeah very yeah. closed off whereas in other fields like especially like in genomics or in emerging diseases and things that where we really need to understand things rapidly people are finding that the more open it can be the better just because then we get answers faster when there's more minds set to it well that's um i think the the recent mission um joe biden is is leading a cancer initiative of the cancer moonshot and that was one of his big talking points was that we want to make this ca this cancer research more open so that people can uh, you know that you know that someone else is doing the same thing and make these connections and he's advocating for that same idea that we can move faster if we're com communicating with each other i didn't even realize it was siloed until he started talking about it and i was like well i guess i can see it being kind of you know not intentionally always just sort of how your systems work things get kind of closed off Right. Yeah. Well, you know, before we let our let you go, sort of a call to action to our listeners. If they, you know, imagine the science teacher going, I want to do something with you know my students in my class. We talked about um, options with eBird and things like that. I think sending them to your book is a good starting place. Is there? Is there? Do you have a a recommendation? If you know the the first yeah, well, foot step, is there a citizens? season? For uh, citizen uh, science, is uh, well probably if we're talking I, about teachers, probably. <laughs> I would recommend that um, that teachers take a look at studentsdiscover.org, mm -hmm. um, especially for the lesson plans, because those are lesson plans ready to go um, that are really um, just super, super will fit into classrooms. And um, and then I guess I also recommend that they go to scistarter.com mm -hmm. and make an account and start to explore um to just help navigate this whole world of citizen science because it can be a little overwhelming at first because there's so many projects and so many ways to participate but you can really sort of i guess filter and look like based on your interests you know mm -hmm. if you want to study the weather or birds or plants or phenology or water quality or you know um just whatever might be of interest do like, you know off i guarantee the top of there's a project that is suitable to your interest <laughs> do you know off the top of your head if any of those resources have alignments to the next generation science standards? Oh, yeah, for sure. The students discover ones do, and I think Bird Sleuth at Cornell, Lab of Ornithology, I think those do as well. I was looking, Karen, through your Twitter feed, and uh, there was like a, something you retweeted, a picture of a, uh, um, it looked like a millipede in my mind, and you know, it was like, what is this? And that's something I've done, and I was like, ah, you're, 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 think, you're considering that citizen science as a, as a form of it, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, you know, and there's apps specifically for that, too, like iNaturalist. Yeah. That would be good for people to know that, like, these communities of experts, you know, that then will see the picture. Oh, yeah. Like, and then can identify it. I have to tell you, and, Karen, uh, I, when I'm doing these shows, often I write down resources so I make sure I get them in the show notes. You've got a list so today, Brian. I have about five different <laughs> post-it notes. And I just, like, <laughs> keep running out of room and ripping one off, like, no, ah, another one. <laughs> I was just great. Um, <laughs> I, I, um, yeah. The other thing. 
is, uh, I mean, just sort of tangential, I guess, just related to Twitter, is that I, I have this um, have somewhat chat. monthly chat, the sit-side chat, which usually has guest panelists, and we do discussions. Oh, okay. Like, uh, you know, um, once a month, we'll have just a, it's a super fast discussion oh, on okay. citizen science topic. So the sit-side chats I host. And then I also have this rotating Twitter account called I Am Sit Sci, which I'd love to have some teachers on it oh. one day. Um, but I've had different citizen scientists and then different scientists and whatnot. And people just host it for a week and then share their perspectives and experiences in citizen science. Oh, neat. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Karen, for talking to us and the work you're doing, promoting citizen science. Um, I just love the idea. It, it, it parallels, in my mind, to some of the DIY and make movements that are happening. Um, same kind of thinking. Oh, yeah. that's. I mean, I consider that part of it, too. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. it is. Yeah. Well, thanks um, so much for your time. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. I appreciate chatting. For links and other information related to this episode, visit laboutloud.com. You can send us your questions and comments at laboutloud.com slash contact. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you've subscribed on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, or your favorite podcasting platform. And if you really enjoyed it, consider leaving us a rating or a review. Your feedback helps others find our show. Until next time, I'm Dale Basler. And I'm Brian Bartell. 